What else? <laughs> I'd like to talk about the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze. Some of you guys have already heard a lot of what I had to say about it, so I need to change angles so that you get a new, a new view. Those of you who are listening to this for the first time, bear with me. After the technical stuff, it will get fun. What would be the most concise way of summarizing Deleuze's contribution to the history of philosophy? I've been thinking about this for several days. <laughs> At least two. That's several. And uh, I came up with this conclusion. Perhaps the best way of explaining it, at least the best way of start the explanation, is this. Whereas most Western philosophy, from Aristotle to Kant, is based on the distinction between the general and the particular. I'm going to explain this in a second, or elaborate. Every single philosophy, because logic is based on the general and the particular, and to the extent that logic was at the center of philosophy since Aristotle, from Aristotle to Kant, the general and the particular, general truths, particular truths, general meanings, particular meanings, have been at the center of philosophy. Deleuze rejects that dichotomy. He won't deny that there are general truths, like all humans are mortal, and that there are some particular truths, I am human. But he would say that is just a phenomenon of language that has nothing to do with the world itself. And remember that despite the fact that the belief that the world exists independently of our minds, fully independently of our minds, is not exactly a fashionable belief in the 20th century. Most 20th century philosophers believe that we construct the world with our minds. Deleuze had the guts to come out and say, despite the fact that being a realist is equivalent of being a child molester, <laughs> I'm a realist. I believe not only that the world exists independently of our minds, but the world has an expressivity that is non-human and that it is crucial for artists to resonate with that non-human expressivity whether it's a geological expressivity of the mountains, whether it is the dramatic, ever-changing skyscapes that our atmosphere offers us every day, very expressive, and even when it's all gray, it has a certain sadness that's expressed, whether it's the expressivity of animals, like bird songs or territorial animals with their colors and their nests, or their the bright plumage or the, 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 the bright colors of territorial fish, any kind of non-human expressivity has as much to teach us about art, or to, if not teach us to inspire us, as the best human novelist, the best human musician, the best human painter, the best human choreographer. So Deleuze is the first one who gives the non-human world its place. Because all the materialisms, such as Marxist materialism, even though they are much closer related to Deleuze than idealism, the, 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 the thought that we create the world, that we give form to the world with our ideas, Marx was so concerned with political economy that the most important material entity he brought into his philosophy was physical labor, the physical labor of the proletariat, which is, of course, a very important material entity. Most idealist philosophies based on language or based on logic leave out physical labor. The body enters as a token material object. Oh yeah, we're talking senores, we're talking signifiers, we're talking meanings. Ah, and then there is the body. The body is sort of like the token material object. And so it's not even a real body. It's the, our ideas of the body are signifiers of the body. So if not even the human body makes it into idealism, you can imagine mountains, birds, clouds, turbulence, any kind of non-human form of expression. So Deleuze goes beyond Marx in his neo-materialism, we might call it, 
in welcoming the non-human world. And again, not as a token, not as a, well, you know, we're humans and we've developed our culture and we've transcended nature a million times, but now we want to invite nature to also come in. Now, he's saying, in order to be an artist, you need to become animal. That is, you need to cease to be human, all too human, and make you best not to identify with a cat or a dog, or wear a costume of a cat or a dog, but make your best as an artist to invent for yourself an animal personality, to feel intensely in your heart what it is to be non-human, even if it's just becoming a plant. Sometimes that is easy when you actually eat plants like mushrooms or peyote, in which after a few hours you are a mushroom, you are a cactus, that is a real becoming. But the Lewis wants to teach us how to get sauced in water, as he says, how to get drunk in pure water. I hope he hadn't died so he could tell me how you do that, because I tried it since I got here and it's not working yet. But not joking. Becoming animal, becoming molecular, becoming mountain, becoming rock, for him, it's a mental act that's super artistic. It's perhaps the most artistic moment. In, in what is philosophy, he, he, in, in his description of art, he singles out this becoming non-humans as a, a very important source of creativity for the artist. Even if you have to come back to your human body to do the painting, to stage the choreography, to create the video, and then be a human with the people in the gallery and in the opening and so on, and go back to the being human, all too human in the cocktail party, you at least know in your heart of hearts that you became something else, that you were capable of leaving the shell and, and, and not afraid of becoming vampire, or becoming werewolf, or becoming a whale, or becoming a bird. It needs an enormous power of imagination to do that. So, the lesson has a lot to teach us about that. I want to, right now, I'm going to return to this theme of becoming animal in a second. Because I want, to, I want to make it more than a metaphor. If becoming animal is just a metaphor, then in what sense are we living language? We're kidding ourselves if we're using metaphors. So this needs to be done in a literal way. And the way Deleuze, or one of the ways in which Deleuze uh, kind of blazed a trail for us to follow in these becomings was mathematics. He saw in mathematics something much more schizophrenic than language, much more crazy, much more bizarre, very little understood by the way it is taught in schools. Most of us are made mathematic, I've made phobics of mathematics in high school by the ridiculous way mathematics is taught. All you're thinking about throughout the semester is, is this going to be in the test? Whereas what you should be thinking is, what becomings are numbers make possible? Or do numbers make possible? What becomings do the calculus makes possible? Becoming infinitesimal, for instance. You know, those are becomings that Leibniz and Newton, when they were inventing this calculus, were already speculating about, and they were centuries of speculation from the Greeks to the scholastics about these infinitesimals, about these, these mathematical entities. And just like there are infinitesimal, there's a whole variety of mathematical entities which do not reduce to language, even if we have to use language to talk about them, which escape the prison of language, which escape meanings, which escape semantics. 